Okay, and you faced me the right way this time, John. <laughs> where, where did you put my hat? I don't see the hat. Uh, underneath. Oh, underneath. Yeah, it's right here. You hit it on me. I, d I did, yeah. Okay, go away now. <laughs> Thank you, John. I appreciate that kind introduction. <clears throat> it's certainly good to be here, and um, I wanted to talk this morning about lessons on fishing. A couple of weeks ago, Pastor Kevin taught on <clears throat> the reality of hell. It's not a place you want your friends or your family or co-workers to go to. It's not a good place. And last Sunday, I understand he preached on the gospel, the fact that Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead. And uh, this morning, I want to take that another step further and see if we can't uh, pull out some lessons from the scripture on how to enhance the broadcasting of the gospel, how God might make us a better fisherman. You know, there's a lot of different ways to catch a fish. <clears throat> there was uh, a man one time in his backyard, make sure I don't step off the stage here, I've done that before, and uh, he saw his, uh, his neighbor, a young boy, digging a hole. And he called over the fence and he said, Timmy, what are you doing? And Timmy said, well, I'm digging a hole. And the neighbor said, well, I can see that. Why are you digging a hole? And Timmy said, well, I need to bury my dead goldfish. And um, the neighbor said, oh, I'm sorry to hear that, but uh, why are you digging such a large hole? Goldfish aren't that big. And little Timmy said, well, my dead goldfish, you see, it's inside your dead cat. <clears throat> well, now that I've alienated and angered all the cat lovers, <laughs> let me see if I can redeem myself and tell another one. There was a man who was out on a frozen lake one time, and uh, he drilled a hole, sat down. He'd been fishing for a couple of hours, did not catch one fish, not even a nibble. He was about ready to pack it up and leave when a little boy came out, another little boy, and drilled a hole, sat down near him, and within 15 minutes, the little boy had caught six fish. And so the man asked him, what is your secret? How are you catching all these fish? And the little boy mumbled something at him. The man didn't understand it. And so the man asked again, now, son, please tell me, what, I didn't understand you. Can you tell me again what your secret is? Again, the little boy mumbled. And finally, a third time, the man said, look, son, speak more clearly, distinctly. Tell me what your secret is. So the little boy spit something into his hand, and then he answered the man, and he said, sir, you have to keep the worms warm. <laughs> That's an old one. <laughs> How do we become more effective and efficient at fishing? Well, I want to look at chapter 5 in the book of Luke. <clears throat> but before we get into Luke chapter 5, let me give you just a little update <clears throat> on chapters 1 through 4. Of course, you know, uh, Christmas time, Luke chapter 1, 2, and even 3 to some degree is often taught and uh, spoken of. The birth of Christ uh, the ministry of John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus Christ. And then in chapter 4, at the very beginning, we read about the temptation of Jesus Christ by the devil in the wilderness. A very strenuous time, a difficult challenge, but of course, the Lord met the challenge. After that, he goes to the hometown of Nazareth, where he grew up, spent his childhood, his teenage years, and even as a young man, he spent his time in Nazareth. <clears throat> if anybody should have known the, the righteousness and the godliness and the love of Jesus Christ, it was the people of Nazareth. He goes into the synagogue, as his custom was, <clears throat> and the attendant hands him a scroll, and he turns to a place in the, in the Bible, the Old Testament, Isaiah 61, verse 1, and he begins to read. And he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because I am anointed to preach the gospel to the poor, set prisoners free, uh, give sight to the blind, and declare the day of the Lord. 
This was an astounding thing for him to say because he's applying it to himself. He sits down and all the eyes are fastened on him and he says, today is this scripture fulfilled in your hearing? And they answer in kind of a pretended attitude. Aren't these gracious words? Wow, wasn't that well said? But isn't this just the son of Joseph? Jesus could perceive their unbelief. <clears throat> of course, he was disappointed. And so he begins a rebuke. He said, surely you will tell me, physician, heal yourself. And that the saying of the proverb is true, that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. He doesn't stop there. And then he says, and even in the days of Elijah, they had that three and a half year drought. There were many widows in Israel, but Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow of Zarephath. Now this was particularly hurtful to them because that's a Gentile community. What Jesus is indirectly and somewhat directly saying is that the Gentiles have more faith than you. It was a strong rebuke. And just to uh, make sure they didn't miss the point, he said the same thing is true in the life of Elisha. During his time, there were many who had leprosy in Israel, but none of them were healed. Only Naaman, a Gentile, uh, a Syrian. This infuriated them, so they march him to the edge of a cliff. They want to stone him. Actually, stoning in those days would, would be to throw someone off a cliff that's at least 18 feet high and then drop big stones on them. But it wasn't his time, and after all, he is the son of God, and he just walked right through them. So he had a very difficult time fishing, but he knew what they needed. It reminds me of a little boy. <clears throat> Maybe I should tell you this is a joke. The last congregation, I mean, the last service, they didn't get it, but... You know it's a bad joke when you have to tell people it's a joke ahead of time. <clears throat> but a little boy asked his mother one time, he said, Mama, what's love? And she answered, well, it starts off kind of small and it starts off slow and it's a little disfigured and distorted at times. And, and then as it grows and gets larger, it gets hard on the outside. But on the inside, it's soft and it's sweet. And the little boy scratched his curly hair on his head and he said, Mama, is that really what love is? And she answered, Oh, I thought you said cantaloupe. <laughs> yeah, it's not a very good joke. But you know, there's a, lot of <laughs> there's a lot of truth to that. There are two sides to love. There is a very soft and sweet side of love. The uh, people of Nazareth saw that for 20 plus years, maybe 27, 28 years. They saw this little, loving, perfect child, a perfect teenager. Can you imagine a perfect teenager? Uh, just amazing. And then a perfect young man. They should have known that he was different. Something was different about him. So when he declared himself and made clear in a very humble fashion, very carefully, that he was indeed meeting the criteria to be the Messiah, that he was in fact the Son of God, the Christ, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, they would have grasped it, but their faith wasn't there. They were destitute of faith, just as Israel was during the time of Elijah and Elisha. So after that, we see Jesus leave Nazareth and he goes to Capernaum. He uh, heals the mother-in-law of Peter. He begins to heal all kinds of people and uh, do other types of miraculous signs. He's doing what we call uh, chumming the waters. I went fishing off the coast of Naples oh, two or three years ago on a very large, expensive private boat. Uh, it cost around $300,000. It was a big boat. So we had lawn chairs sitting in the, the, the boat. It was a very comfortable kind of setting. And since I'm blind, uh, one of the companions, there were three others on the boat, agreed to bait my hook. And so they put a shrimp on my hook, and then I could go fishing. And they baited their hooks, and uh, they start fishing. Now, after about 10 minutes, they're getting nibbles 
they're catching fish. I'm getting nada, nothing, nothing at all. And so I asked the man, I said, should I roll my, my hook in and see if they got the bait? And they just roar laughing. And they laughed for about five minutes and I'm sitting there going, what is going on? And they said, Dean, you have to put the hook in the water. It's still sitting in the boat. <laughs> Obviously, I wasn't close enough to the edge of the boat, but how was I supposed to know? <laughs> well, the same thing is true for us. We have to learn to put the hook in the water, okay? Uh, first thing we do is we chum the waters. We do that at Crossway International by providing water wells, rain harvest tanks, hydro pumps, milk goats for widows. We just provided a, a computer, the first computer that a school has ever had in Nicaragua. And we're hoping to start a um, computer tech school and our training center and an English school. We have all kinds of dreams and ideas of what we'd like to do to chum the waters. We don't believe in toxic charity where you just keep throwing money at something, but we wanna have something that will generate income or generate some kind of ongoing benefit. The milk goats, for example, that we give to the widows, the first two offspring, they're required to give to two other widows. And then after that, all the other offspring belong to her. So there, it's an, uh, kind of a, uh, a plan that just extends itself beyond just the initial payment or gift that we may make. Uh, and then after doing that, we go back and we uh, put the hook in the water. We share the gospel. Uh, that's my favorite thing to do. And it's, there, it's usually always very well received because we use a lot of soft chumming. Very rarely do I have to rebuke anybody. I've done that before, but not very often. I've done it in the park in Lahore, Pakistan, and usually with a religious leader here or there that wants to confront me. And uh, you know, even though I'm blind, I can get a bit testy. I try not to very often, and probably 99% of the chumming we do is really the soft type. Uh, Jesus, of course, had an edge as the Son of God. He could perceive unbelief and knew exactly what to say. Uh, I struggle in that sometimes. But we chum the waters, uh, we do things to get people's attention, to open their hearts to the gospel. We put the fish hook in the water, we share the gospel. And then thirdly, uh, we teach others how to fish. We train people how to share the gospel and also sound doctrine. Now, uh, we see Jesus doing this at the end of Luke chapter four. In uh, chapter four, verse 42, 42, they try to make him stay in Capernaum, uh, you know, where he healed the mother-in-law of Peter and done some other healing. But he says in 43, no, I've been sent to other towns to preach the gospel of the kingdom. And he begins to travel around Judea. And this brings us up to Luke chapter five, verse one. So he's already begun his ministry. Uh, it's not been real auspicious initially in Nazareth, but his fame is beginning to spread as he moves outside of Nazareth, as people begin to grasp what he's teaching, as he shows evidence from the Old Testament scripture that he is in fact fulfilling the requirements, the criteria as the Messiah, the Son of God. And in Luke chapter five, verse one, if my memory will work for me, it says this, one day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, <laughs> Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say, say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat and asked them to come and help. And they came and they filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, 
Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch they had taken. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. We see in the first three verses, uh, I think, uh, uh, a similar to lesson that we read in Luke chapter 4. Remember, he's already been chumming the water. Um, his fame is growing, so he's already done that part. And now he's fishing. He throws one fishing line out with a thousand hooks. And uh, that's an important lesson for us to learn. We need to learn to put the fish hook in the water. Uh, there's a number of ways we can do that. Of course, Facebook is a great way. I'm sometimes appalled at some things people put on Facebook. Even though I can't read it, I hear about it. People will tell me about it. And that always has concerned me. Um, I can also send out tweets. You can sign up to get my tweets on Twitter. I do a lot of emailing, probably four to 500 emails a month. And uh, of course, phone calls and I can text message and some of those kind of, we need to take advantage of every natural uh, opportunity that we have. And we see Jesus doing that. First, he puts the hook in the water, but he does it in an unusual way, in a sense, a very natural way. He asks Peter to put out a little from shore. And if you've ever been out on a lake on a nice, calm, uh, quiet day, somebody can be sitting out on a boat and you can hear the conversation two, 300 yards away because the sound carries over the water. And then that same way, we need to learn any way that we can to broadcast the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ as far as we can. Now, inside your bulletin, there's a letter that I wrote to our neighbors. We have about 50 neighbors in our neighborhood, and it might be something that you could use. We tend to live in a cocoon here in America. We don't have to see people. Uh, it's not very crowded. I was talking to Ed last night or yesterday. He said the people from India, when they come here, one of the things that they first ask is, where are all the people? They're used to really crowded situations. Well, we're so spread out that it's easy to be kind of protected from one another and not have any dealings at all. And you might want to put out a letter and see what kind of response you get. Now, I don't want to discourage you. I don't want to give you false hope. America is becoming a much more difficult place to evangelize. Uh, Matthew 19, 24, Jesus says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. We have so much in America. The poorest person here in America, I mean, let's say they make $800 a month. That would be a fairly poor person in America. That's 10 times richer than the average person, uh, what the average person earns in the countries where I go. These people are hurting. They don't have very much. And so if you can bring in a little bit of relief, oh, they appreciate it. They are so grateful. Um, so chumming the waters overseas is a lot easier than chumming the waters here in America. That doesn't mean we shouldn't try. Jesus did, the master fisherman, and he was rejected wholesale by the town people of Nazareth. But later on, his half-brother, uh, James and Jude, of course, become believers and write two of the letters in the New Testament. So uh, let me encourage you, even though it might be difficult, even though the lake may be frozen over, uh, make an effort to reach out to your neighbors. In fact, God is bringing more and more people to America, uh, more people from India, from China, from all over the world, from uh, Mexico, different locations. And those people are looking for some kind of acceptance many times. Many times they're far more open than uh, the homegrown American person that might live next door to you. So uh, let me encourage you, give that a try. If you try it and it works out, let me know. I'd be glad to get an email from you and hear of any of your experiences on that. So verses one through three, Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. 
with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. <clears throat> and you see what the fishermen are doing? They're not even with Jesus. He's talking about his disciples. They were pretty worthless at this point. But they're probably watching from a distance what Jesus is doing. And then in verse 4, when Jesus had finished uh, speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, master, that's the word epistates in the Greek. It means literally to stand over someone, a supervisor. It's a term of respect. He says, master, we have fished hard all night and haven't caught anything. He's really not into this. His heart's not in it. But because you say so, he has at least enough respect to outwardly obey. Because you say so, I will let down the nets. You know, sometimes it's hard to obey God totally. I remember one time my son was standing up in the back of the car while I was driving. This was back in 1977, something like that. They didn't have laws and car seats and seat belts. And he's standing up in the back seat and I'm driving along. And I said, Jason, sit down. And he says, no, Daddy, I can't see if I sit down. I said, Jason, I said, sit down. It's not safe. So he sat down on the outside. But on the inside, I could see in my rearview mirror. And I could see back then. I wasn't driving blind. Maybe I should add that. <laughs> I could see on his face the most defiant look. I mean, that lower lip was out. Mm, he didn't like sitting down. He wasn't sitting down, in fact, inside. But he partially obeyed outwardly. You know, I heard a sermon one time, and the, pastor, the preacher said, uh, partial obedience is total disobedience. And I came away feeling so guilty, you know, because who has ever totally obeyed God? Even in a, in a certain situation, you can have a wrong thought, a wrong motive enter your head, a wrong something happen, and it was so discouraging. I think that God sometimes can bless partial obedience. At least I hope he does because I'm rarely totally obedient to the Lord. Sometimes we have a very light view of sin. We think, well, as long as we don't rob a bank or kill somebody or... Yeah. Even the smallest sin is, is an a, a egregious thing in the eyes of God. A wrong attitude, a wrong motive that might slip into the conversation or into the situation. A partial obedience, God will and does and has blessed in my life. There's been a time or two when I got on the airplane and I'm thinking, I have no reason why I'm going there. The well, first time I went to Sudan, I thought, this is going to be a disaster. I'd never met the guy. I got to central Sudan. We had uh, it was actually a total of 17 airplane flights to get in and to get back home. It was in a very remote part of Sudan. And we had a pastor's conference with 135 pastors. One of them had walked six days to come hear me speak. I wouldn't come six days. I mean, he walked six days. Uh, it was such a blessing. And yet, I went really half-hearted. I thought, this is going to be difficult. This is not going to be good. But God blessed it. So let me encourage you that even though you may have doubts, <clears throat> you may have questions, um, take a partial step. Take a small step to doing what God is asking you to do. And uh, if you can, take a full step and have a more total type of obedience. Well, certainly, I encourage you to do that. Romans chapter 4 Verse 23 says, above all things, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. It's far better if you can do it with obedience, not just outwardly, but also mostly, you know, a good attitude. That's even more pleasing to God. Um, and so we see God <clears throat> blessing Peter in verses 6 and 7. It says, when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. 
So God does bless partial obedience, even when our attitude is wrong. Uh, If we take a step knowing that, well, that's what the Lord said to do, then sometimes our attitude will come around as we see what God is doing in our lives when we follow his word. Now we come to uh, verses 8 through 10. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord. This time he uses the word kurios, which is a more common word for Lord with a capital L. Uh, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. So we see Jesus beginning to, to weave a net. Instead of just fishing singularly, which we all need to know how to do, like in verses 1 through 3, he starts pulling the team together. He starts uh, bringing and weaving a net of people together that he can uh, teach and train to share the gospel. He's already showed them how to chum the water. He showed them how to put the hook in the water. And now he's training them how to actually function as a team, as a net, as he brings Peter, James, and John together, the inner circle. It's an amazing thing to see how how God, I mean, how Jesus extended his ministry by focusing and pouring his life into 12 apostles. Uh, That is 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, at work. Then we come to uh, verse 11. Then Jesus said to Simon, uh, don't be afraid, from now on you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. We are to be fishers of men. Now you've heard it said, the old saying, give a man a fish and he'll eat for a day. Teach a man to fish and he'll eat for a lifetime. Well, some of, some of us has, have changed that saying. Some of us have it this way. Uh, give a man a fish and he'll eat for a day. Teach a man to fish and he'll sit in a boat and drink beer all day. <laughs> that's, that's not what God's asking us to do. Now, if you take an unbeliever with you and you will win him to Christ, and that's one way to do it through sports. I like to do sports. I've had an opportunity to lead some people or share the gospel uh, with a professional fisherman off the bay of, off of the uh, uh, Gulf of Mexico. This was uh, about a month ago. Uh, a professional fisherman took us out there. Uh, we set the anchor, uh, did the chum, and I'm fishing. I learned some things from him too. Uh, I was out there fishing and uh, I would yank the, 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 you know, the rod like this as soon as I felt a nibble. He'd say, no, 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 that, that's too quick. You gotta slow down. I said, oh, okay. So uh, next time I waited, I waited. He says, well, you waited too long, they got the bait. You see, there's an art to fishing. Uh, you know, if you go too quickly, you chase the fish away. And we know people who've done that, people who've been rude and obnoxious. And so what do we do? We don't want to be like that, so we go to the other extreme, and we become so tactful that we never really share the gospel. I learned that from him. He also, I showed him something here I want to show you real quickly. You see that uh, piece of paper, that blank piece of paper in your bulletin? If you took notes on it, well, too bad. (laughs) We're going to end up tearing it up. But you can tape it back together. I used this on him, and I used it on a a waitress in Nicaragua just recently. In fact, I've been using it for the past six to seven months. We had over 1,300 people come to faith in Christ last January when I spoke at... uh, six different events. I'm having just hundreds, thousands of people come to faith in Christ. And I use this as one of my illustrations, which seems to capture and captivate their attention. So hold your paper like this vertically, you got it? And then you take the top right corner and you fold it down like this to kind of make a triangle. Okay, you gotta do it real even now. Now some of you ladies might have to help your husbands they, they may, may not have done very well in coloring and paper folding. It's been a while since they've had that. Do it as evenly as you can. It should look like this. Look like that? Okay. 
Now, once you get it to that point, you put your thumb down here and you, you fold it back over this way so it looks like a house. I did this with uh, Clementine last night, the granddaughter of Ed and Sandy. Nine years old, she was able to do it. I'm blind, I'm able to do it, so no excuses. Does it look like this, real even down here where it's folded, real symmetrical, looks like a house? In fact, when I folded it like that, Clementine said, oh, that looks like a house. So I know it looks like a house, even though I can't see it. Now, you start off this way. One of the best ways to teach people is by contrasting things. So you say, uh, this represents the house of God. Uh, John 14, 1, Jesus says, do not let your, ha your heart be troubled. You trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, and I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, there you may be also. So God wants us in his house, but how do we get there? Well, you gotta go back to the first fold, go back to the triangle, and you tell him, now this is the sail on a sailboat. Can a person get to heaven by a sailboat? And of course, they say no. And you say, you're correct. And in the same way, you cannot get to heaven uh, by being good. So you're beginning to contrast what doesn't get us to heaven. Romans 3.23 says we've all sinned. Psalm 14.1 says there's none who are good, not even one. So just like you cannot get to heaven by a sailboat, in the same way you cannot get to heaven by being good. So then you go back to the house. Okay, back with me. And you say, <clears throat> okay, uh, but God wants us in heaven with him. How do we get there? Okay, now this time you're gonna fold the two sides of the house together so there's a crease from the tip of the house to the middle of the base of the house, so it looks like this. You're getting ready to make an airplane. Now the guys might have an edge on you girls on this one, but <laughs> it should look like this. And once you make the airplane, don't throw it, okay? And then you, make, you fold down the wings, but you gotta make a very big wings. They have to be very large wings. The body of the airplane should be about the length of your thumbnail, and it needs to be as even as possible, the body of the airplane, okay? You with me so far? Okay. Now, I did this with the waitress in Nicaragua. Her name was Marbeli, and she was tracking right along with me, and I said, now, everybody got the airplane made? Okay, now can you get to heaven by an airplane? Again, the answer is no. And I said, in the same way, here comes the contrast, you cannot get to heaven by a religion or by water baptism or by doing anything. It's not through those means or whatever maybe they have brought up in a conversation. So you can't get to heaven by an airplane or by keeping God's commandments or whatever it may be. Well, let's see if we can find another way. Pull the wings up, go back to that position here, point the nose of the plane down like that, and then begin to tear the wings off along the crease. It took my wife three times to do this. I don't know why, but bless her heart, she had trouble. She kept folding the wings down, but you gotta tear the wings completely off from the body of the airplane. Okay, so you're left with the body of the airplane, right? Now, the paper's kind of thick towards the end, so it gets a little bit tough. Sometimes people use scissors, but they won't let me have any sh scissors at the house. <laughs> I have guns, but they won't give me scissors. <laughs> now, this looks like a powerful rocket. Can you get to heaven by a powerful rocket? No, you can't get to... And the same way, here comes the contrast, you can't get to heaven by powerfully trying to serve the Lord are powerfully trying to do anything. You see, it's not through our works, it's a gift. It's not, by, but to him who works not, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited to him as righteousness. So how do we get to heaven? What is the way? Well, very carefully unfold the rocket and maybe we'll get a clue. Let's see what kind of, now if you did it right, okay, you should get a cross. Okay. <laughs> now, 
This works really good for children or people with a childlike heart. Uh, let me encourage you to try it with your children, your grandchildren, brothers, sisters. I've done it with adults, and adults have been, wow, that's kind of interesting. Now, in America, it's not so amazing. We have video games and all this, but overseas, it's like, wow, it's like magic almost. But it's important that we learn how to share the gospel. That's an, uh, one of the best lures I've used to make clear what the gospel is not. It contrasts how we do not get to heaven, and in the end, gives us a hint, the cross. Now, when I showed that to Marvely, her answer was, well, I haven't sinned all that much, okay? I said, well, let me share this illustration with you. I said, uh, let this hand represent everybody here. This wallet represent things we've done wrong. According to the Bible, we've all sinned, Romans 3.23. But God says he loves you, he hates your sin, because it's that sin that separates you from God, just as this wallet separates my hands, okay? And God wants us to have our sins forgiven. There's nothing we can do to remove them of ourselves. And I said, now, let's say that my hat represents good works, and maybe you've only sinned a little bit, and you've really done a lot of good works. You're a good worker, you're honest, you love your parents, you go to church regularly, and then you die. And God comes to you and he says, why should I let you come into heaven? And you say, well, God, look at all the good things I've done. And he says, wow, <laughs> you are really probably the top 1% of the good people on earth. But wait a minute, what's underneath there? Uh-oh, I see a little bit of sin. We can't let you come in. You break one commandment, you're guilty of them all, okay? We have such a light view of sin sometimes, we don't realize how sinful our hearts really are. Our hearts are deceitful, and they don't want to see wrong attitudes, wrong motives. And if you die in that state with your sins unforgiven, you spend an eternity separated from God. But let my right hand represent Jesus Christ. He came to earth, lived a perfect life, and he chose to die. He died and paid for your sin. And then on the third day, he rose from the dead. Isaiah 53, verse six says it like this, all we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's the beauty of the gospel that he offers us. He says, look, you give me your sins, and in exchange, I'll give you the free gift of eternal life and my righteousness, which, it, which you need to qualify to enter heaven. I, you'd have to be a fool not to accept that. You'd have to be willingly blind not to want that or want to see that. And when I showed that to Marbley in Nicaragua, she says, I understand it, I understand it now. And I said, well, let me ask you to uh, say something to God. I wanna lead you in a conversation, and I'd like to do that with each of you here today. I did it with her eyes open. I don't pray with people uh, when I'm trying to lead them to Christ. You never read anywhere in the Bible, let's pray to receive Christ. You don't read that. People are just confronted with the truth. And uh, anyway, I said, uh, just say something like this to God in the quietness of your mind. And maybe you're here for the first time or maybe not, you're visiting or whatever. Just say to God in the quietness of your mind, yeah, I admit I've done things wrong. And then secondly, I'll ask them to uh, say something like this to God and tell them you understand there's a penalty for the things you've done wrong, which the Bible calls sin. Somebody has to pay that penalty. Tell God you understand that. And then thirdly, tell God that you understand now that Jesus Christ paid that price. He died in your place for all past, present, even future sin. He paid it all for the sins of the world. Tell him you understand that and that he rose from the dead. And then tell God lastly, that you're trusting only in Jesus Christ, not in your own goodness, not in your ability to reform your life, not in your ability to commit your life and serve him, but you're willing to just right now trust only in Jesus Christ, who died for you and rose from the dead. And then I tell people, if you've done that, 
If today was the first time you understood that message and you put your trust in Jesus Christ, you have eternal life. And I'd like you to let us know. Come up and let me know afterwards. We also have some pastors or elders or deacons in the back, I think. Uh, should be something up on the screen. Uh, that would love to talk to you. And now would be the time to pray for you. Uh, because prayer is an important part of Christian, the Christian walk. But it's not prayer that saves. Muslims pray five times a day. It doesn't help them at all. Uh, the Jews pray at the Wailing Wall. You have others that, pr pr that pray station to station. So prayer is an important thing, but it's not what saves. It's faith in Christ, trusting in Christ alone Amen. that gives eternal life. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for this beautiful passage in Luke chapter 5, how Jesus uses a contrasting illustration a contrasting illustration in this way. He has Peter catch physically living fish that become physically dead as an illustration to contrast what he's really called to do. He is to catch spiritually dead men and women that become spiritually living people. Father, you're such a master teacher there's so much in this text for us to learn, to chum the waters, to love people. There is no greater uh, lure in our tackle box than love. Uh, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. And we pray, Father, that your love might flow through us, uh, that we would be effective in reaching out to the lost around us, even if it's just a partial step even if it's just partial obedience, just a little something, Father, help us overcome our doubts and our fears. May we be found more faithful serving you no matter where you would lead us. Uh, I know it's a lot easier for me overseas where the fish are jumping in the boat, but at the same time, we have that responsibility to be a fisherman wherever we may be. You've called us to come and follow you and you say, you will make us fishermen. So if we're not catching fish, somebody's dropping the ball, and it's not you. So I pray, Lord, that you bring things to mind, ways that we can reach out. Thank you for Faith Community Church. And again, if there was anyone here that understood this message for the first time and trusted in you and your son, Jesus Christ, who died for their sins and rose from the dead, and guarantees them eternal life as a free gift. I pray they might come up and tell me or one of the other members of this church, help us to love people, to work like a net, to bring people into the, into the community and enjoy the fruit and the blessing of you and all that you have to offer. Thank you again for this opportunity, and God bless Faith Community Church. Amen.